Um, hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, full, full hearts and full stomachs. It's been a really, really good day, and it's about to get better, better, better. Um, so, just a couple quick little things about schedule for this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have this um, fantastic uh, panel, and then uh, we'll take a little break, and then we will read at 3 p.m. with Jaboni, and then have another break for dinner. And just another reminder to everybody to please uh, turn off your cell phones. Uh, and then it is my absolute pleasure, honor, we're so delighted uh, to welcome Indie Star arts journalist Wei Chen, who's moderating this panel. I'm very excited. I think in the media we talk about um, this, this idea of um, like a hurricane where it's like everything surrounding the, the actual thing and then you have like a, a emptiness like on things like so I think with this is more of my art. I I will do everything except for see the actual play. I'm so excited. I wish you guys would you guys like put on the, the play again or something like that where I can see the play, I read the play and read everything about it. I don't know if every you know people use social media or go online to see all, all this kind of controversy started by these you know, two critics. So um, I'm very happy that you guys are here to talk about this play and then all the things that's going to happen after these two critics were these two reviews. So, um, so you know, just introduce yourselves and just start talking about this really, really, really interesting play. Sure. My name is um, Hallie Gordon. I'm the Artistic and Education Director for Steppenwolf for Young Adults at Steppenwolf Theatre Company. I, um, I'm a producer, a director, and a programmer uh, for uh, young adult theater. Um, my age group that I work for is uh, eighth from the twelfth grade. Great. Hi, I'm Lisa Cortez. I'm also from Chicago. I am a director. And I'm also the head of MFA directing at the Theater School at DePaul University, and I'm the artistic director for Chicago Playworks. Many of you will be at the Theater School at DePaul University uh, in a couple of days, I think, <laughs> driving up the 65 uh, for the TYA USA conference uh, run by my dear colleague, uh, Ernie Nolan. Um, uh, and I was the director of This Is Modern Art uh, at Steppenwolf. Pally was crazy enough to hire me. <laughs> so actually, I want to start with uh, expert from the review that was in the Sun Times. So just like, you know, the paper reading about a play, you know, a lot of people will we read reviews of plays they've never seen. So, so this is what she said about this modern art, and then we can learn about what the play actually is about and what, what you know what the message actually is. So, I mean, I don't know how long she's been at the uh, some time, but she said this play is wildly wrong-headed and potentially damaging work, one that fails to call vandalism by its name and rationalizes an attempt to justify the vandalism vandalism in the most irresponsible ways. It also trades in all the destructive, sanctimonious talk about minority teens invariably being shut out of opportunities and earmarked for prison. In a way that only reinforces stereotypes and negative destinies, counterproductive in the extreme, it deepens and solidifies racial and class divisions and a sense of hopelessness among those who need to dwell on possibility. Um, and Henny West, she's, she's older, she's She's white. Um, <laughs> and then Chris, Chris, Jones, Chris Jones from the Chicago Tribune writes, graffiti comes at a price that can be invasive, self-important, and disrespectful of the property of others. And plenty of struggling folks have had to clean graffiti off something they own or love. Graffiti can be inartful, for goodness sake. More importantly yet, graffiti had the effect of making people feel unsafe in the city, it terrified people. It was only when public officials de declared themselves determined to wipe it out, the cities finally came back to life with broad benefits. Um, there's no real time, uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, no, so there's no real time <laughs> of graffiti in Lisa Porter's production, which really bugged me, actually, although I did admire the acting, and the way Portis connects these artists to the audience. At one point, the characters all provide a lesson in how to create graffiti. All that was missing was handing out spray cans to the audience. Um, so. Yeah, I was curious about that part about how he, he was bummed out that there was no, uh, I, should, I should first of all say Chris Jones is a friend. Any of us who work in Chicago theater, we're a community. And you know, we both know Chris and we both know Hetty. Um, and they both have been in the papers for a long time. And um, you know, Chicago has a real history with the uh, critical community started by Richard Christensen, where the um, critics are really part of the community. It's not like um, 
in other cities that I've lived in that will go unnamed. Um, but uh, so the first thing to say is that these are folks that we know. Um, uh, but I was curious about Chris's idea of there being graffiti on stage because one, it's like it's toxic. You know what I mean? Like the fumes. And then two, you know that they were actors. I mean, they're, they're, they were not graffiti. Artists and graffiti on the stage. art is hard. It, it's hard. It's, it's an art skill. Form. It's a yeah. skill and it's an art form. So this is modern art. It's about four uh, young graffiti artists in Chicago who set out to tag the side of the new modern wing of the Art Institute, and it's based off of. So this is recent the, uh, events in 2010. Right. So this is a this is uh, for those of you who don't know, this is modern art is based on two events. These were taken from interviews from many graffiti artists around the city, um, based on these this graffiti crew that graffiti bombed outside of the Art Institute of Chicago, the new modern wing, which was a three hundred million dollar building. Um, and just as it opened, um, they graffitied their names over the student entrance and put, this is modern art. So it was a political act that they were, the reason they were doing it. It wasn't random graffiti as, was as, these, as these reviews would lead you to believe. It was a um, very specific act of saying, we are not invisible, we live in the city, and we will be heard. And that's what the play was about. Yeah, the play was about you know how, how they came to that moment, um, the how the how the graffiti crew came to that moment, and then the fallout from that moment. Because the both the reviews will say that there was no fallout. Um, a group of friends, four friends, um, who started the the, the the groups you know worked together, created together, ate together, lived together, and then after this event went underground and dispersed. Um, and then, Though none of them went to jail, they're still underground. Um, the statute of limitations has not run out, um, and uh, I, I'll be interested to see what happens when 2017 comes around and they can come out. What will happen? Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for them. How did Steppenwolf um, come in contact with the writers, Andrew Stillman and Kevin Cole? How did you guys decide to commission this play? Sure. Well, Kevin Koval is um, the artistic director of uh, Young Chicago Authors and founder of Louder Than Bomb. And so he is um, well versed in um, uh, youth programming and hip hop uh, culture. And Idris Goodwin, who's a playwright, um, is, has worked under Kevin. And they came to me um, with this idea. And um, I thought it was a beautiful story and really interesting. And I came from a place of not understanding really what graffiti art is and being very curious. Um, and generally that's how I program things. Things that I don't understand is what I like programming. And so I wanted to learn more about this world that I didn't know about. Um, and so that's, so they came to me, we commissioned them. Uh, we did a, a workshop, we got into the New Voices, New Visions of the Kennedy Center. Uh, we did a workshop there and a reading, some of you might have heard that reading. Um, and then we did another workshop at Steppenwolf, and then the show went up. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea there would be pushback, graffiti being something that Yeah, I knew, yeah, I think we weren't, we weren't kidding ourselves. I mean, I think we knew there were specific, like the moment that, that is referred to about the showing young people how to graffiti, the tools that are needed. Um, we knew there would be um, a lively, I would say a lively conversation about it. We did not know that we would be railed against because of our, uh, our inability to have a moral compass with the show. And I think my surprise came out of the fact that the critics really felt like they had the right to say what was appropriate for children, um, for teenagers, and what wasn't. And to me, that's not reviewing the play. That comes from a very personal place. Um, and I will say, too, that the critics who come and see these shows do not come to a student performance. I think Hetty may have, Chris did not. They come to public performances with the general public. They do not go to our teacher residencies. They do not um, go into the classroom. They do not stay for the post-show. They do not read our study guide. They don't go through our teaching artist training programs. They don't know any of the work 
uh, that goes into what it takes to put a show up for young people. So what I found controversial was not whether they liked the play or didn't, but that they were saying, I mean, Hetty's title was What Was Stepping Up Thinking? And to me, that's a judgment that goes far and beyond what any critic should be critiquing. Well, I think what's interesting, and the reason that, I mean, the reason this turned into a firestorm is because I mouthed off on Facebook. Um, <laughs> I did. I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who, well, I'm currently, there's a lot of conversations going on around the country about diversity and inclusion. Um, TCG, uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Institute, LORT, a, uh, Actors' Equity, USITT, um, Broadway, uh, the Bro what is it, Broadway, um, Broadway League, there are conversations happening in, uh, uh, all over the country, and of course in TYA, we say about diversity and inclusion, and somebody who's been a part of those conversations um, a lot, um, I was, uh, I just couldn't be quiet, because I felt that this was not, had they, had either Chris or Hetty not liked the show, you know, uh, the direction is terrible, okay, I mean, that's fine, you know what I mean, or, the acting is, you know, whatever, we don't like to play. But the fact that it felt to me sensorial, it felt to me like this content should not be put in front of young adults. Hallie Gordon doesn't know what she's doing. Um, Steppenwolf um, uh, is being irresponsible. And that's when I said, well, well, who, from what lens are Hetty and Chris looking at this? And they're looking at it from a very particular lens. It's a, a white upper middle class, slightly older. They're not much older than I am, but um, which they love us now. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's like uh, when, when, when Chris says um, people are terrified of graffiti, it begs the question, which people? Which people? Are, or when Chris says, our way in is through Selena, who is a white, uh, the white, the white woman in the play, right? The other characters are all of color. So when you hear our way in is Selena, who is our? And it was that that I really um, kind of mouthed off about was this idea of who's um, deciding what's appropriate for young urban teenagers in the city of Chicago, one of the most uh, complex, uh, multicultural um, uh, uh, um, cities in the nation, and deep, also a deeply segregated city. I mean, what Hallie did when she programmed this piece is she kind of turned Steppenwolf inside out you know, the insiders were no longer your average theater-going audience, and no longer the critics were used. They weren't, we, uh, the insiders were not the insiders, the insiders were the outsiders. And the insiders were now the teenagers who were coming to see the play. To some extent, Hallie graffitied all over Steppenwolf. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Steppenwolf graffitied on itself. And um, it was just interesting that, that, that the afterwards, it's like the play, what happened afterwards was like the play happened. Mm -hmm. You know, that... Hallie graffitied on Steppenwolf, and Steppenwolf supported her in that, and then the critics went crazy, and then the city went crazy. You can't do that. You can't write that at Steppenwolf. You can't do that. So it's interesting the way in which kind of life imitates art. So being in the business for a while, like, you know, you have interaction with the critics, and sometimes you get mixed reviews, positive reviews, negative reviews. Is this is the first time you've kind of mounted yes. a yeah, because again, I, you know, it's a critic's job to let us know what they think of the of the work itself, you know, mm -hmm. of the artistry. Um, that's, but it's definitely the first time because it was a, a for me a political a political fight, you know. So yeah, it's the first time I've mouthed off. What? So no, it's the first time you've mouthed off about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I've mouthed off about critics and, and Facebook. And I was actually, I, Hallie was prepared for it. I wasn't prepared for the reviews at all, and I, um, I wasn't prepared for the um, level. Of, well, I, 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 I have to say that um, the, the first review you read from the Sun Times, um, and, I, and I was laughing because I, it's hard to take that seriously. I, I, I mean, it really, to me, it feels so over the top um, that, it, you know, I, I don't know, there, there's something unreal about that. If you had written a play about this, no one would believe it. <laughs> it's, it's just, it doesn't, it it's comes from so much fear, um, you know, that it's, it, it's not even a review, you know? I mean, it's, it's a therapy session. It's not, you know, so it, it's hard to take that 
that the sometime tribute series. And yet you still have to say something because when you have black and brown bodies on stage, young black and brown men on stage, and the reviewer calls them urban terrorists, mm -hmm. you yes. have to say something. I Which mean, the Sun Times did. The yes. Sun Times called them. And the Sun Times also, you know, and I will say this sometimes because I believe that they should be responsible for what's being printed. Um, but the Sun Times likened it to gun violence. And, sure. you know, to me, again, this says something, you know, in terms of where we're at, that, that graffiti art. Um, can induce that kind of fear that the next step, if you see graffiti art, that means someone's going to get shot. That there's there's something, and obviously we know this. Just look at the the the, the world. Just look at America right now, that we are living in, and that a piece of theater is supposed to speak to this, right? We are supposed to present work to young people that allows them an opportunity to think for themselves question, to wonder, to be passionate, to be curious. Um, and this play did all of those things. And I think that there's there's fear in that. There's fear in opening the door of curiosity. Um, when they feel, when adults feel that, that underlying it is the wrong message. So <clears throat> Chris Jones, the writer for the Chicago uh, Tribune, was pretty like responsive. Like he was on Facebook and uh, yeah. I don't know if you know whether like Facebook friends or you know, you yeah, guys were connected. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, you, you know, he said, you know, the review wasn't about race, that he's championed a lot of, um, uh, you know, African American playwrights, you know, you know get a lot of African American, you know, mm -hmm. you know, people of color on the stage. So it, it wasn't, you know, he didn't feel fair that um, you, know, you guys be defensive or, or pulling that, that card. Yeah, I mean, Chris, Chris is a Facebook friend, and he is a friend. We yeah. teach together at DePaul University, and we were recently all three on a panel together. Um, uh, and I, you know, again, the way critics work in the community, because critics are a part of community, Chris has indeed championed a lot of really fantastic work. I just think he got this one wrong. You know, I just think that his point of view on this one was a little um, oh, tinnier and slightly blunt. But I think that he's, you know, I, re I respected his opinion uh, and I respected everything that he's done in Chicago. I just think he was on the wrong side of history on this one. But I will say that I'm, and I mean, and I mean this authentically, I don't mean this sarcastically, I'm incredibly thankful for the reviews from the Trib uh, and the Sun Times. And I will say, you know, Time Out, uh, Reader, New City. All of those reviews, the fact, one, that they're coming to review TYA Theater um, is important um, and huge um, and allows the work to grow. Um, and also, because they were so personally affected by it, it allowed for this conversation. It allowed for the community to really think about how we critique theater, how we critique new work, and how we critique something that makes us feel uncomfortable. And what is that conversation? And um, how do we have it with each other? How do we be in the same room and have it? How do we be in the virtual room and have it? But that the fact that this conversation is happening and that Lisa and I are here today still talking about it, I think is really important. And also I want to say, I really, have great uh, respect and admiration for Chris, precisely because he did stay in mm -hmm. the debate. He did get on Facebook and stay in the debate. Um, I mean, he'll tell you, as he said in the panel, he said he just happened to be in a room alone in New York drinking, and he was like, oh. <laughs> 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 so we had to get, you know, you know we all know that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he, did, he, he spoke that out loud in the panel yeah. we were on. But he, um, I did respect him because he's continued to show up. You know, we were all asked to be on a panel together at Paul, and he did show up. And they, um, uh, Chris has remained in the conversation, and I respect that um, and admire it um, because that's when you actually have a healthy debate, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to you know, thought shots. Mm -hmm. Which also, which also. So when, when we were talking about race, like people talk about, you know, it's like the question of authorship. Like, do you judge the thing itself, or the, do you look at the color of the person who wrote it? You know, if you look at a play, uh, you know, about an African American family. Like sometimes there's a question of well, was a white writer, was a black writer, and can I judge it based on the color of the writer? So can you apply that to the critics? Like if, if there were two black critics who had written the same thing, like 
how much does it matter the color of skin of, of of the people who wrote this in a different view. I don't think a person of color would have written what the Sun and Times published. I, I just don't think it's possible. Not, not with that tone. There's a lot of hatred in there and fear. I don't, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think anybody, any color should be able to be a critic. I mean, I don't, but I think that, um, again, I think it's because it comes from personal, perspective from this moral compass of this is not right, uh, in which these stories are important to be told. Um, these people, are, you know, are, are exciting and um, real and authentic to the city, and their voices are important. Again, it's okay if you don't like the play, if you didn't think it was, you know, even enough, if you didn't like, for whatever reason, that's fine. But this story is valuable um, to the community. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Hallie. I don't think that uh, a person of color would have written a Sun-Times review. And if, uh, and if somebody had written similar reviews, whatever their color skin, I probably still would have mapped them. <laughs> so, so as a arts critic and reporter, like I, I get really nervous when I write reviews sometimes because I'm like friends with a lot of local mm -hmm. playwrights and it, you know if I wrote something bad about the IRT or something like that, I don't know, I talk to Courtney and Janet and you know, all the people all the time, so I'd be really nervous and so for me it's like it's my craft and I kind of unleash it and then hopefully people like my review and, and then you know, like, if, if people, people hate it, it's like oh my god, you know, why is all this backlash against my review? So that's kind of like the way I see it, where it's like, there's just, there's just two writers, they're just trying to do their job, and then a bunch of people kind of swirl around and they kind of race card. So someone's eyes, I sympathize with just a writer trying to navigate, you know, being truthful to what their opinion, and then not just being nice and trying to please everyone all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I again, and I, I, I would say this to Chris in person, and I'd say it to him in front. I think that a writer, uh, a writer in a city like Chicago, um, has a responsibility to think about the totality of the city that he or she is speaking for. That doesn't mean that the point of view has to be. So I'm talking about content. I'm not talking about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Aesthetics, again, have at it. And I'm talking about whether or not something is valid to be on stage, whether or not this topic is valid on stage for this audience. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think when it's funny. I mean, okay, in the future. But I think that um, you know, as theater artists, we are used to people being against us. You know what I mean? So I think sometimes if, if, the, if the community responds to a critic and says, "Hey, guess what? We think you're wrong," you know, and I kind of go, "Well." <laughs> so you can take some too. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think. Um, I, I mean, I think just. I, I think it's challenging for artists because this is in print, you know, and this is, um, and it's important. Uh, it's important for our audiences, it's important for ticket sales, it's, in, it's important to the artists involved. Um, uh, you know, it's important whether a new play gets done again. Um, you know, it's important whether a theater decides to do a new work or not do a new work. Um, so I think all those things are important. And, I, and so I think what was fascinating is that, you know, the theater community lashed back and said, this is too important just for it to stay in these two reviews. And that's where the conversation came out of. And I think that, you know, I think we're very lucky the, uh, at how close the theater community is in Chicago, but I think they basically said enough is enough. And I think we're allowed to, just like the critics are allowed to say what they say. And, you know, Hedy and Chris have had to be right to write what they wrote. We have every right to talk about how that makes us feel and how that makes the community of people they're talking about feel. And it's important for that community to talk about it as well.
you know, I think it's so interesting, like, this is a play about the relationship between artists and like, the people who act as gatekeepers and people who decide who becomes artists and not. And I think um, traditionally journalists and arts journalists have thought of themselves as gatekeepers in, in, in certain ways. Like, we validate, you know, what we, we kind of curate uh, in the art scene. And there's this really interesting, um, this really interesting scene of the movie, uh, pull up, uh, talking about history, the idea of um, an artist making its, its mark on history. And, you know, graffiti, is, as you know, that's marked in a legal spot. It gets reported. The property owner needs to pay a fine um, if, it, if they don't do anything about it. So it'll be buffed in like one, or two, three days. Mm -hmm. So the relationship between kind of this kind of visual art and history. So uh, there's a scene where JC, mm -hmm. uh, one of the graffiti artists. So the the three graffiti artists and the fourth character is the is the lookout. The, yeah, yeah, the lookout. And so JC, he kind of he, he like wants to make his mark in history. So he says, "Legends stand on their work. When you discipline yourself to become a great artist, legend legendary status will be left to those who write history." And then seven, the other main character says, "Well, what if people who write history are some narrow-minded busters?" who stay getting late passes on what's fresh. JC says, the hope is to be great enough, to be disciplined enough, and, and put in so much work that my legacy will be undeniable and history will write itself. Seven says, I feel you, Jace, and you, my man and all, but I'm saying, fuck those who write history. I'm saying, I want to do something that will have an impact now, not years from now, you know, because now is where we live, and now is all my stuff, and now is the only time we've got, and you know that better than anyone. So he says, you know, with like history. So that could be a common towards museums, but also arts critics as well. Can you talk about like, a little bit more about the content of the play? What do you mean? Just in, in, in terms of like this idea of the people who write the history, who, who say, this is what happens, you know, with Chicago's theater scene. I mean, I, I can see that within the play, within the play, there is, and speak to this too. Within the play, there is a debate about um, where and how art happens, mm -hmm. and who legitimizes art. Um, and I think the graffiti writers, there are graffiti writers that do permission walls. There are graffiti writers that do mural. There are graffiti writers who go down to Miami um, during uh, Art Basel and create work that stays up. There are other graffiti writers, and there are, there are some, some of those graffiti writers will say it's not really graffiti unless it's illegal. Some graffiti is described as it, it's not graffiti unless it's illegal practice, otherwise it's public art. So there's a big conversation about the relationship between graffiti art and permanence, and um, what, what constitutes a piece of art. If it's impermanent, is it a piece of art? I think those of us in theater would argue, uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, if it's illegal, is it a piece of art? Um, so I think there's a lot of conversation about the relationship between permanence, art, and legitimacy in the piece. In terms of, um, I think too in this particular scene, he, he was also talking about the fact that he wants to make history when he's alive not when he's dead, but that he wants people to see and hear him now. Um, and there's, again, that goes back to the sense of not being heard and not feeling like you're going to be part of these graffiti artists in real life and in the play know the uh, canon of art, history art, and they know it very well. It, but nobody knows their canon. You know, nobody knows their art. Nobody knows the famous graffiti artists that started in the late 70s and 80s in, you know, in the boroughs of New York, you know. And they tell us who they are, you know. And so they're, you know, they feel marginalized on many levels, you know, on, on what they look like and what they do. And I think that's what, you know, that's what he, Seven, is frustrated. You know, it's so interesting because that question that you raised earlier, like when you said, as a critic, it makes me stressed out when people, you know, if I wrote my thing, then everybody, there's a backlash. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because to some extent, and I think you're trying to get at this, right? The thing to do with a museum is to pay, a, a, either, a, you pay a fee, you go inside, and you see the art. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The thing to do with a review is you read the review and you take it or leave it, you know. Um, but the thing to do with a museum is not to write on the outside of it. And the thing to do with a review is not to spot off on Facebook about it. I mean, it's just interesting because the whole kind of interaction is really about who gets to say what, when, mm -hmm. and where, and where. You know, so from the, that's the that is the that is the core of the play itself, and it is the core of the controversy that happened after the play, which is the the um, the theater critic said this, and usually that would be the end of it, right? Because that you know we don't we don't generally respond, nor should we nor should we necessarily. You know what I mean? But in this case, it's a bunch of us did respond, and so that in some extent to some extent is like scribbling on the outside of the museum. It's um it's it's uh, going against the norm in order to in order to ultimately bring up a count, in order to create a counter narrative, finally. A counter narrative, a graffiti is a counter narrative to the narrative of the city of Chicago. Um, the, the argument on Facebook was a counter narrative to the, um, the, uh, uh, the unified critical point of view about whether or not this was appropriate on stage. How has the way you've looked at theater criticism changed in the past like 10 years? You know, so Facebook and Twitter and you know, like other bloggers that you interface with now, like are the are the critics still as powerful and as many as they used to be before? How that has changed? I don't know. I mean, I think it's. A, I don't. Uh, you know, I try not to overly pay attention. To, <laughs> I really do. I mean, this is a this is a very special. This is a very special case. But I don't. I don't. You know. I mean. You know, I think um, I th I think that to, as an as an artist, not as a producer or programmer, but as an artist, um, yeah, I think it's better to leave that aside. You know, I think as a producer and a programmer, um, it's it's challenging, um, and I feel I feel like the Chicago Public School District. Uh, I feel very fortunate in that they trust the work that Steppenwolf for Young Adults does. They don't, those teachers don't necessarily read reviews and then book their tickets. But we were almost sold out before we even started marketing this as modern art. Um, we were in a 500 seat theater, which we normally for a new play don't open the balcony. We had to open the balcony for this as modern art because it was the first play it was a play that was actually talking about visual art. Um, and so we had art schools coming and art classes coming and um, everyone got a script ahead of time. Everyone knew the language of it. Everyone knew the age appropriateness of it. Everyone got stuck, you know, there was, so there was all of that involved in it. And so, you know, the fact that it got a bad review or a controversial review um, usually does not matter. The interesting thing about this is that schools who came and brought their students then read the review because they heard about the controversy, spent classroom time mm -hmm. discussing it uh, and analyzing it and really having a really interesting, robust conversation about what their students saw and what the critics saw. We got many letters from students and teachers around this, and I had high schools and universities from all over the country calling, asking for the script because they were reading the reviews and they wanted to teach it in their in their class and they wanted to have an open conversation about art criticism. And so, I mean, that's just awesome. I mean, that's great because it, it, it to Paul alone, I taught it in one of my classes. The reviews, people had seen the play. Um, Chris taught it in his class. Uh, Koya Pass, who runs Free Street, taught it in her class. You know what I mean? Like, so that's it to Paul alone. That was weird. This, I, I mean, I guess what's different now is I think critics still have power. I absolutely do. Otherwise, I, I may not have said anything. I think, you know, I was, I was fighting for the audiences that, might, that weren't being seen by the critics. Um, and I was also fighting for the fact that I want other plays to do this kind of work. I want other theaters to get, I mean, other theaters. I don't want other theaters to get scared of programming new work about that makes people uncomfortable, do you know what I mean? Because it's essentially, I, I, I would hate to see a smaller theater, a theater that isn't as well insulated as Steppenwolf, mm -hmm. decide not to do a play 
that is, this is modern art, or like this is modern art, because of fear that the critics uh, might shut it down. But, but what I would say that the critics, are, um, what is different now is that Facebook provides a platform by which if you want, if you have something to say, you can. Whereas uh, writing a letter to the editor may never make the paper. You know, so. I, I will also say that I think, you know, the reason this show was targeted I'm sure the review would have been somewhat different if this was for an adult audience. Mm -hmm. I think the reason it was targeted was because Steppenwolf for Young Adults presents itself as an educational program. And with that comes a certain amount of responsibility, as you all know, whenever you're doing work for young people, there's a certain amount of responsibility involved. And so the lens in which these, the, this play was being reviewed was through that lens. The unfortunate part was they never saw the work involved, like I mentioned earlier. So I do think that this is specific because we are saying this is a show for young people. It's about these artists that do something illegal and get away with it. Though there are repercussions for that. One, there's you know, one loses his life, basically. One loses all his friends, doesn't have a job, can't paint anymore. Um, and one actually learns self-confidence and understands and is excited by the fact that he is now being asked to, to do permission walls, meaning he's getting paid. And he likes being able to sign his name for real as opposed to a false identity. So I think, you know, Again, our kids, none of our kids walked away saying, where's a spray paint can? I want to go spray paint something. But all of the kids that we work with walked away with this idea of their voice and how important it is to follow your passion and what that means and what does it mean to be in a world in which uh, there are certain areas, certain people, certain places that you can't do that. And what does it mean to fight for it, to be able to do that? And so that's what they came away with. And not to mention the fact that they now go on the train, they now drive in their car with their parents, and they see the city in a totally different way. And this happened for adults, too, who said, I was on the train, and I saw this graffiti, and I saw the initials. I knew who you were talking about. I knew what it was, and I wondered, how did they get up there? So they started viewing their city that they had grown up in, that they had lived in totally differently. And to me, that's such an amazing, beautiful thing. Yeah, to me, what the play did is it made the city legible. You know, this little bit. I mean, it really did. The city that you're not used to, you're like, oh, what's that? And then suddenly, my kids are like, oh, mom, that's any law crew, or that's so-and-so crew. Oh, oh gosh, my kids are together. Mom, that piece got buffed. <laughs> three weeks and they buffed it. Why'd they do that? Um, but you know, it allows you to read because the city cities are encoded. You know, cities are encoded, um, and there's there is a narrative that's put forth by the you know the powers that be in a city, and then there's a whole uh, a whole other narrative or a number of narratives going on. So it just made the city, I think, legible to many people. And there's one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, Oh yeah, I, the argument just reminded me a little bit of, you know, when Elvis first moved his pelvis on. <laughs> don't do that, don't show the kids that pelvis movement. You know, I was like, don't show the kids that graffiti. Don't show them that. And then, you know, I also protest that. I think that young uh, teenagers um, have minds of their own. And I think that the incredible care that Stephen will put into everything surrounding the production, the study guides, the, the um, talkbacks, the education in the schools, the, the workshops, I mean, no kid that saw the show was like, oh yeah, go do something illegal now. And every kid knew it was illegal. No. What, what's going to happen to the play? Do, do, you, do you have any idea? I don't. I mean, yeah. I think you had um, a couple people ask for it, we'd send it out. I don't know. You know, again, this is an interesting conversation. It falls into that weird area. You know, we, we commission produce plays that is for a specific age group, which I mentioned, 8th through 12th grade. So it's too old, right? There's seven and younger. Mm -hmm. But the theater, you know, community as a whole views it as TYA. So it may not go on the main stage of a regional theater. 
So it, it's a weird, it's in a weird place where a lot of our show. I mean, there's only a few of our shows that have actually, like the Bluest Eye um, and a couple other plays that we commissioned and produced that have gone on to, you know, a more general audience rather than just a specific age group. So I don't. We'll see. We'll see. So can you talk more about like how this play and the themes of the park? I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I Should we open it up? Yeah, I, I yeah. Think, um, because I, I uh, just on that second production, that I, I would love to hear you guys speak about uh, what uh, strategies or what offerings would you, not only in production but in outreach, for the, the you know, knowing what you know now, and in, a, in the second life of this, produced somewhere else, what were the, what were the things that you would share with those producers, you know? Yeah, you gotta be brave. I mean, I think, you know, you have to, I think you have to go, the, we thematize our season each year. This thing is create a movement, the art of the revolution. So obviously we did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we opened with Animal Farm, a new adaptation of Animal Farm. And, you know, here's animals killing animals, and nobody really cared about that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think, so we, you know, so we really programmed this season in conversation about what does it mean to have a revolution, which was Animal Farm, and why do we have revolutions? What are the importance of that, and what is the cautionary tale that comes out of that? Right? And then this is modern art, was how do we create that movement? What does that look like and feel like? What do you need to have a voice in something? And I think that, you know, in terms of, um, in, in terms of guiding and framing it for your <coughs> audience and for your teachers and students, we found that very helpful. Mm. I think that it might be interesting to figure out how, I mean, I'm thinking of the critical community right now. I don't know anything, I'm not a producer. Well, I am, but not for theater that uh, Chicago Playworks isn't dependent on reviews. Um, but uh, uh, I would be interested in, if I were producing someplace else, seeing if I can get features about graffiti or graffiti artists in that city, trying to create a conversation in advance in the newspapers and in the media about graffiti and graffiti art so there's a context bubbling ahead of time, you know what I mean, that into which the piece might come. I don't know, though. Um, I, I think as a director, I would just say um, uh, the charisma and presence of the actors who are talking to that audience are really, really important. Um, it's important that the people who are in the audience see themselves on stage. Any other questions? There's yeah. one right You've spoken about the theater community response and the education community response. I was curious about what was the museum's response and what was the visual arts community response? <coughs> Both the East and the controversy. There, okay, so the, the, the Art Institute, right from the get-go, we were in conversation with them, we gave them a script, we told them we were doing this. We actually had an open reading at the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, in which we invited museums, other museums to. We were in communication with their community programs coordinator, um, their educational coordinator, we were ready to do a big panel with Kevin Koval and Miguel, who um, uh, is a graffiti <coughs> artist and also teaches at the Art Institute. And the script kept going, moving up higher and higher <coughs> in, within the theater internally. And the Art Institute, as are many arts organizations, is a very big bureaucracy. Well, it got as high as it could go, and they said no. Um, and <coughs> so, no, they said no to the panel, and they said no to a partnership. They said, um, they said, uh, we we'll totally, you know, go ahead and produce the play, go ahead and do that. Um, we, uh, we, t we respect that. We, there's still many hurt feelings at the institution to have this conversation, which I found really interesting, because of course the, 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 the crew who worked in and I shouldn't say crew because that means something else in this context, but the, the staff that worked in the educational 
community programs area said, this is exactly the conversation we need to be having. Where does art belong? You know, what does it mean if graffiti is inside? Does it make it graffiti? Like, we're having these conversations behind doors. Now's an opportunity to open it up. But they weren't, they weren't, they just weren't ready. They weren't ready. Um, I will say, though, that they, they did bring a group of students who work at the art, you know, they have their own kind of count, young council there uh, to see the show. And they asked questions during the post show. And so it was, it was a good, you know, it was a good conversation. And I, I felt good on both sides of how we kind of cooperated. We cooperated not to cooperate with each other. So, <laughs> so that was the institute. And then what, what was the other part of that? The larger earth community. Oh, yeah, we, that is, um, the, oh, yes. We got pushback from Emmuel made you look. So this that's is really, crew. that's the graffiti crew that, at, that, bomb, that bombed outside of the modern wing. Apparently the graffiti artists that these were based on, who did that, were not officially Emmuel crew members that's the yet. Oh, Kevin says that's not Well, this is, but, okay. <laughs> the, so apparently this is what the elder, this is, this is all vocabulary I just learned throughout this process. The elder of the crew said they were on um, probation. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know. That's what they said. They hired a lawyer. Um, they went to Kevin, the writer, and said, um, you know, you're appropriating our name and our artwork, our likeness, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we had a really great conversation. We invited them, him, to come see a rehearsal. Uh, he did, we were in really great conversation throughout the process and everything ended up working fine. He loved the show. He brought other graffiti writers to see it. We ended up having the major national graffiti artists there on stage. Almost every graffiti artist that was actually mentioned in the play happened to be there one night. We got them all up on stage um, uh, for a post-show conversation that was just Slam. incredibly, incredibly moving. And so that was an interesting conversation, you know, controversy that ended up not being anything, but was really, you know, these artists are artists, and their work matters to them. And that, you know, again, that was just another moment for us to be like, that's right, they're artists. Like, everyone who's a part of that art making needs to be a part of this experience. Um, we had artists, you know, coming to see the show that have never walked in the door of Steppenwolf Theater. I mean, I have to say that I would say about 50% of our audience have never walked through the door of Steppenwolf. The most class, race diverse audience, age diverse that I've ever seen. And then over here, yeah. First of all, the story of the controversy about this play would make a great play. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear from everybody on the panel about the idea of, uh, Tally, you said a number of times, the critics who really blasted you were not aware of, nor did they participate in, any of the preparatory work that you did with the schools and those things. <clears throat> what are the rules or the constraints or the boundaries of inviting critics to those types of things, first of all? Uh, <clears throat> and just a quick anecdote, in the city I'm from, we have a couple of major critics who refuse to come. We send them tickets. They say, we don't do children's plays. Uh, one lady made a famous statement by saying, oh, it is about time for us to review Metro Theater. I think I'll send my 12-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you guys think those kinds of barriers can be broken? So, so let me just repeat the question for the live stream, I guess. So this question is about you know, inviting critics or behind-the-scenes looks for more insight to, to kind of like draw a review. And so what's, are there any policies on how do you guys work? I, I think you can absolutely invite them and they most likely won't come. I mean, the, you know, I had a conversation with Chris Jones about this and he says, that's not, that's not, I don't do that with any theater. I mean, he reviews a lot of TYA theater. He's like, I don't, I don't see that work, residencies, 
you know, kosher discussions at any theater, adult or, or do adult or otherwise. And I'm like, well, fair news, then don't be the moral compass, right, of what, right? So, I, I mean, I, I think there's got to be a compromise on both sides, you know. I totally, under nor, does, nor does he or any other critic probably have the time to invest in that. So then I think they have to come from a perspective that they don't, and they are not going to invest in that. So then what does that mean in terms of how they review the play? And again, I will say um, the critics have been so important to the success of Step More for Young Adults programming. Without a doubt, they have really elevated the program to a national level in which the work that we do is important and done again and again. And that is valuable. And that is, of course, why you want to get the critics there, is to kind of raise the bar and raise the level. Um, always invite them. Always invite them. And I will say one thing. There is an amazing critic in Chicago, and her name is Ada Gray. And she is about 11 years old. If and, she, she, and, and I would give anything if she would review a Steppenwolf for your girls. I don't know, she was even at Animal Farm and she didn't review it. But she is amazing and everyone blogs about her, everyone posts her reviews. She's been doing this since she was six years old. And it's because the community has said this is important, her voice is important. So make that 11-year-old voice important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> one there, and then there's one there. <laughs> yeah, one there. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you guys had possibly heard like Banksy exit through the gift shop the documentary about the London or the media scene. And whenever somebody watches the documentary, they think, oh, that's you know, that's so innovative. Look at their modern art, and yet when you put it on a live stage, it becomes this huge controversy. And I just wanted to get your opinion on what makes it okay to be in a film, though it's a true film, it's documentary. What makes it okay to be in a film, but it's not okay to be performed on a live stage? Well, Banksy has achieved a kind of fame. I mean, Banksy's an accepted artist right now. You know what I mean? I mean, we're not Banksy's talking. We're not mainstream. We're not talking about Banksy. We're yeah. talking about 20, 22 year old uh, young graffiti artists who, um, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a snowstorm, went out and wrote their names on the modern wing, the newly opened modern wing with the, the artist from Chicago. You know what I mean? I think Banksy's already achieved legitimacy, so I don't think it has to do with film versus theater. I think it has to do with where the artist is in relationship to the uh, larger community, and whether or not he or she's accepted. Although I think that that film is helpful, and a lot of our teacher, teachers, before they came and saw this as modern art, showed their students that film. I think I thought it was really great. So, so the question was about uh, the exit. No, yeah, we're, we're good. They can hear us. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the gentleman right um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm really conflicted about this whole um, discussion um, uh, about about the show, uh, about enhancing people feeling it's their right to enhance private property um, in their own way. I just, it, that's a whole very interesting conversation to have. The conversation about criticism of theater, um, because, you know, I, I, I wrestle with this because I, I find criticism to be, um, to be a, a, a personal opinion, an opinion, uh, a social commentary, I, I think, as well. Um, it could be kind of viewed as, and, and to be upset about social commentary on social commentary is um, kind of odd for me. Um, in, in a way, I don't know, I mean, I really kind of understand what you're talking about when you talk about, you know, the perspective that that social commentary comes from and whether or not it's appropriate to be printed in, in the newspaper. Um, I just go back to Frank Rich, who is now writing, you know, editorial opinions uh, for the New York Times, to go from writing theater reviews um, to social commentary. Um, so I, I kind of wrestle with that idea about saying, you know, you have a responsibility, you know, to a much greater idea um, of, of what this play is and what it could say versus writing your own kind of personal commentary. I mean, once you write it, you have to, you know, live up to 
your own responsibilities to what you said, um, I suppose. But I, I just, I'm just saying, I'm wrestling with this discussion a lot um, about um, how to hold someone responsible for the future of the play and you know um, uh, things, the future of Chicago theater and. You know, I, I, I kind of wrestle with all of this. Those were, those were really big words that you were using there, um, well, that, think, that these people you said hold in their hands. Uh, well, I think it, the reviewers aren't on the opinions page. But they're opinions. I know, but the reviewers are on the editorial page, right? They're on the arts page, and I think, I think reviewers, uh, in other words, the public doesn't see them as, uh, in, in terms of the readership, I don't think that the readership views a review the same way they, re they view an editorial on the editorial page, um, uh, which is very clearly one person's singular point of view. And there's usually a couple of them that may argue with one another, you know? Um, but I absolutely agree with you. I think um, the, uh, Teddy and Chris have every right to say what they want to say, and they have a very large platform on which to say it. And uh, we have every right as artists to produce the work we want to produce uh, if it's somebody who picks it up. And I think then also the community has every right to talk about, you know? I mean, you're right, it's all just opinions in the end. Right, it's, like I said, yeah. I wrestle a lot with it myself. Yeah. No, it is, a, it is really, I mean, it is very interesting because it, it, in a way what happened is mirroring what the conversation is in the play, um, which is an important conversation to have. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, I just want to say one more thing. At lunch today, we were talking about Montreal, and I mentioned just out of my own mouth that I was shocked when I went to Montreal for the first time because it's covered in graffiti. Mm -hmm. The city is covered in graffiti, and it isn't what we're used to seeing in our country at all. And, you know, I don't know if I had an opinion on that. It just was very striking to me to see um, the proliferation and, and, and how it was as graffiti as art versus gang tags or whatever, um, you know, which are completely different things as well. Miami, too. There's a district of Miami um, that is absolutely all permission walled. It's beautiful. And then Bogota. There's, you know, I mean, it just depends on where you're going and what the city's sense of uh, graffiti is. And I, you know, and I will, I mean, fair news, it's a complicated conversation because uh, a lot of graffiti art is bad, you know? And I, you know, and it's, it, there's no question about it. And do you want graffiti on your, on your, you know, garage door? Do you want it on your uh, business? No. I mean, these are all really important questions to ask. And the other important question to ask is, why is it happening? What is lacking? Why is it happening? Yeah. Can I just say something about the, you were talking about the role of criticism. I, th I think right now arts critics are like dealing with this existential crisis where we're caught between newspapers, which are, you know, shrinking. They're not hiring, like, newspapers don't hire arts critics. I'm an arts reporter, I'm not an arts critic, I don't write reviews. Uh, this has been a topic within the Indianapolis community, but there's some critics at Nubo, maybe in Indie Monthly, but the Indianapolis Star, uh, you, you know, used to employ uh, critics, do, do not uh, employ critics anymore, uh, I, I'm an arts reporter, so my, I kind of amplify the voice of the artists rather, rather than my own, which I think is great, but um, we're, we're kind of caught in the, in the section of front page news, sports, and other things that drive a lot of web traffic, are, are viewed as more essential than arts, which is like a niche category within like mainstream newspapers. And then I'm caught between that and the arts community that you know has a very interesting relationship with critics as well. And so, so I think some of you are looking for arts communities to say, hey, can you help fund our, our jobs? Can you help support us writing about arts? Because I'm an arts lover. I want to write about the arts. But people over the newspaper world aren't really seeing my value. The new millennial readers, they're not paying for arts critics. And, you know, our, yeah. this kind of stuff happens and, and you know, the, the relationship between the critic and the arts community gets really frayed. So but I think right now, I'm just thinking, well, this, I don't know if we'll even be having this conversation in 10 years. In 10 years, it'll just be opinions on paid on Facebook. There won't be this profession anymore. So I just think it's interesting that, that that's what's going through my head, you know, like Henry Weiss and you know they're older. I, I don't know any younger full time. Like if that eleven year old can have a profession based off that, that's great. She becomes a YouTube star. That, I don't know if this is like this profession is very much an endangered species right now. Um, oh my God. Uh,
<laughs> I think there's an issue that has me concerned about in this. Um, the outcome of, of this in terms of you know, the response and then the conversation, what I think is terrific about this is that it allows you to have a very public conversation in a variety of ways, which was exactly what you had hoped and wanted to have happen. So I think that's a huge benefit for this. I think what has me concerned about our field is when we are trying to present material that may be considered more controversial even for younger audiences and present it in such a fear-based climate mm -hmm. that the gatekeepers, rather than allowing this kind of public discourse, shut it down. And I'm, I'm thinking of you know two plays that we all know, uh, the play Along Came Tango and the play The Transition to Duke Pequeno, both two plays that were for much younger audiences, have had significant development in these kinds of formats. But as we know from recent events, have had a great deal of controversy about even letting them get to the point where an audience can have that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think nothing has the volatility of, of, of issues, of particularly issues dealing with gender identity or those hot button things that touch on what may even be such a latent and not so latent forms of homophobia, et cetera, that just flash points. So, I, rather than just looking at this issue within this particular context with this age group, what would you have to say to those writers out here who are looking to explore controversial material or material that is so current right now in terms of producing this kind of work in a fear-based climate? They have to do it. I, I mean, they have to do it. And, it, you know, you know, hopefully they can find a um, either an artistic partner or an artistic organization that can support that. Because there's no other way. We cannot not do it, you know? And we will fail and we will succeed. But I, it's those, you know, this is why we do work for young people. Because if they're not talking about it at schools and they're not talking about it at home and they're trying to talk about it with each other, they have to have a safe place where they can have conversations about things that are important to them and that matter. So you're going to have to take the risk, you know? And you're going to have to take the risk that parents may not like it, teachers may not like it, uh, school officials may not like it, critics may not like it. But what if the students do? What if the students are changed by it? Well, then it's worth it. I think that it's interesting because there's not a lot of theater for young adults. You know, Allie's running one of them. I don't know how many there are in the country, but that seems to be an arena that's a little bit more porous. And that's and somebody by young adults. You don't. We're talking of specific teenagers. Yeah, I'm talking about teenagers, high school, junior, right. upper junior high and high school. Because there seems to be. I mean, if you look at the novels they're reading, oh my God, do you even? Know? <laughs> I mean, um, there seems to be a little bit more play in that group. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of theaters for young adults. I think once you get into because I my theater Chicago play, which is for um, elementary school kids. And that's a tougher community to, especially, it's so funny, you know, if you, those of you who are involved in TYA, in Assetage and have traveled, you see that we are really, we protect our kids like nobody's business in the United States of America. I mean, I think that many countries, what would be considered an adult, you know, like moth, for example, you know, or I'm thinking of a couple of plays that I've read that I can't imagine a theater producing because they seem so tough, you know, and uh, I think we protect, we potentially overprotect our children. But um, certainly, I think where there's been controversy in Chicago, it's been around Albany Park, or this, it's been where teenagers are actually grappling with some tough territory. And that's actually what Chris has generally spoken up and said, wait a second, wait a second, why are we doing this? Um, but it's an area that seems a little bit more poor, so I'm like, how can we make more theater for young adults where if we can't do it for the elementary school kids, can we start in junior high? You know, um, can we start in that age when they're already thinking gender identity, sexual identity, um, sexual violence, um, uh, rebellion against the system, all of those things. But I think, I agree with you, but I think we must do it. Oh yeah, I agree. Younger and younger. Thank you for saying that. Um, uh, one observation, and, and well, a couple of observations. First, um, I think it's remarkable that theater still has this power for, for forever. Um, <laughs> Uh, theaters have been a vehicle for shaking up the status quo within existing power structures. And in this day and age where I think we all feel so marginalized, um, 
because we're no longer the only game in town, that it can still do this is, is really, really um, gratifying. Um, and it seems, so the second thing is, there's a really interesting series of rebukes stacked upon rebukes in this story. The first tagging of the outside wall of the brand new rental piano, et cetera, et cetera, was a rebuke from the have-nots to the haves. Mm -hmm. And then the creation of this play, one could argue, was a rebuke from a half to another half. Mm -hmm. And then, right, the writing of the review, and then the response to the review, mm -hmm. it's, it's an incredibly public um, s series of uh, 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 comments and, and criticisms um, that's uh, so surprising and, and um, uh, wonderful. How, however, wherever you find yourself falling in the sort of socio-political spectrum represented in this story. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a great comment. And also that Kevin, I would say that Kevin Kowal, uh, I mean, the, the rebuke on the outside of the museum, the rebuke from the, the, the civic community to the rebukers, then the Kevin writing the play as a rebuke back you know, interviewing graffiti writers, rebuke that, and then Steppenwolf producing it. But I think, I, I mean, I, it's true. I mean, in a way, Steppenwolf is that institution mm -hmm. that the people in the play are talking about. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. You know, so is it, the artist, is the theater yeah. world's art institute of Chicago? Yes, mm -hmm. which is, I thought, what was so kind of cool about it. But I think that idea, it makes me feel like we're in a comedy of manners. I rebuke you. <laughs> <laughs> I was very struck by, I think, a, a quote or a quasi quote that one of you lobbed. You can't write this at Steppenwolf. That is so deep to me because, of course, that suggests that it could have come, what, with more veracity, with more acceptance from another theater who? Albany Park, Free Street, I don't know, who? And that Steppenwolf, that began as this scrappy little, completely iconoclastic, let's push against all ethics and morals theater is now viewed as this bastion of upholding something. <laughs> that has got to rake you guys over the coals. <laughs> that rakes me over the coals historically. I, I just think that's big stuff to understand. Uh, yeah, it is. And I have to say that I, the, the support that we got from ensemble members was really incredible yeah. around this. Yeah, we're back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we go. We're on the edge again. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Yeah. yeah, it is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things that it's exciting that the visibility of this and uh, the dialogue back and forth in many venues has, I think, in many ways elevated the many other theaters that are also doing work for young adults uh, across the country who are doing great and wonderful work, but that this has been a spark point to start conversation. Um, and so in, Ele you know, in Steppenwolf, being elevated to that kind of public discourse, um, I hope that other, you know, that the rest can come up as well to that level of visibility um, because I think a lot of the work is invisible, though it is high quality across the United States. Um, and then also, I would love to offer back to playwrights, being somebody who has recently been in conversation about the transition of Doodle Pequeno mm -hmm. at People's Light and, and the, I'm going to put this in air quotes, feasibility mm -hmm. of that play. I just want to say to the playwrights in the room, that please take, please understand that in the word no, there is also a communication of respect for the work that we don't, that in not asking you to change it, to soften it, or to water it down, that that's also part of that no. Um, I know that that, you know, that doesn't feel good receiving that and, and saying, you know, no, we can't, I don't think we can do this in our community, or I don't think we can do this in our community right now. But that also means that your work maintains its integrity. And, 
And so I just, I hope for courage in finding the right, you know, the right community. And I hope that more communities recognize that if they don't step up, uh, or that they need to step up, because we need more of those communities that will accept that. Yeah. Did you guys produce Transition to Work Again? We partnered uh, with Gabe to take it to New Visions, New Voices, mm -hmm. and then we produced a reading of it in a format, I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with the Theater of War, but they go into uh, communities of veterans with Greek plays like Ajax. Uh, they do a reading of the play with professional actors. The actors leave the stage. They invite uh, panelists who may be veterans themselves. They may be spouses. They may be medical professionals that are dealing with PTSD. They offer their personal response to the play. And then there is a facilitator who opens a, a dialogue amongst the panelists the community, but that the artists step down and they do, they usually don't participate in the conversation. So we did the transition to the Pequeño in that model of, mm -hmm. uh, we presented the reading, actors left the stage, we had panelists there to respond to the work, and then we had a conversation. And it was so interesting that the conversation did not go to issues of the use of the word gay as an epithet, or to uh, sexual identity or gender identity, it went to bullying. And the vulnerability that it exposed from the individuals in that room, some of them were our board members who are in their 70s, um, some of them were very young, uh, and it ran the whole spectrum in between, but it, it became a discussion of bullying and not about any of those things that everybody was afraid of putting on the stage in the first place. That's One more question. <coughs> Is there anything else you guys want to say on the conversation? No, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me.